Greetings, dick snaps. This is Slats Every Day, head base fingerer in King Parrot, and you're listening to Detention Mosh Session on MCHC Radio with your friend and mine, Paddy Emmett. Now sit down and shut up or I'll bite your fucking head off. Hey, Sean, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Yeah, good, man, good. I see just a picture of your face with a big dick on your nose. Ah, yeah, it's some dick glasses thing my friend gave me. (laughs) Yeah, I told my dad before that I was interviewing a band from Detroit, and he said I should ask you if you've ever met Rodriguez. No, can't I have. (laughs) Sorry to disappoint your father. Uh, it's all right. It's just the old folk question. <laughs> so this interview is for Melbourne City Hardcore Community Radio. I'm sure a lot of people in Melbourne and the rest of Australia aren't familiar with Child Bite yet. So introduce yourself, explain what Child Bite sounds like, and give some other basic info. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm Sean from the band Child Bite from Detroit, Michigan. USA, um, the what we sound like question, that's always a hard one usually for people to, to answer, but uh, we are somewhere in between um, like like early 80s hardcore, like the original shit, like Black Flag, Dead Kennedys, uh, late, later Misfits kind of stuff, but, but also mixed with metal stuff and kind of a quote unquote alternative from the 90s because that's when uh just the age group we're all mostly in our 30s um most of us grew up around then so like the weird main like quote again quote unquote uh heavy mainstream stuff from from the 90s like uh i don't know bands like whatever uh trying to think like early nirvana to to primus to you know all that all that weird shit and faith no more uh, Jesus Lizard, kind of the uh, noise rock kind of thing. Uh, I'd say it's it's some mix of all that shit. A band that I think that we do sound quite a bit like, but it was not intentional because I didn't hear them until much later after this band had already been going. But for your uh, local listeners out there, a band that I would think we would be compared to is the Lubricated Goat. That's an awesome name. Oh man, you got to look them up. They're they're an Australian band from the from like late '80s through the '90s, and uh, yeah, I, I first checked them out just because somebody mentioned their name. I was like, "Lubricated Goat." I have a feeling that's gonna be my favorite band ever that I've never heard, and uh, checked them out and loved it even more. Could totally relate to it. Half of their songs I feel like I wrote, and it's a uh, it's pretty awesome. You got you got to check it out. Your local heritage. I'm going to listen to that right after this interview. All right, man. Yeah, there's a song, uh, one song I, in particular I'd recommend called uh, Spoil the Atmosphere. I like that one a lot. Awesome. I'll check it out. So what do you want your listeners to take away from your music? Ooh. You know, we're uh, like, kind of like how I, how I just had a, a lot of trouble describing us. It's for those types of uh, eclectic listeners, the guys that... um. You know, you know, I and it's no no big deal if you're into just one kind of thing, and that's all I'm into, and that's fine. We're we're just not like that, and we all come from like all we all listen to all sorts of shit, and we're not afraid to let the freak flag fly and just uh, let all these weird uh, influences be you know come to the surface and be uh, be uh, I don't know all equally show, and no matter how embarrassing or or obscure they might be. Um, so as far as something that like for listeners to, to take away from us, I don't know. I mean, the big thing is the uh, energy. And that, I guess that's one thing that could be a uh, universal, whether you're talking about like old hardcore bands, punk bands, or like a uh, weird, like heavy, you know, uh, post rock noise rock shit or extreme metal shit. Uh, it's all got like this intensity to it. And, Regardless of what genre we're kind of uh, dipping our toes into or letting uh, show up more prominently in a particular song, I think that that uh, 
intense energy is is the main thing that is always going to be there. If there's anyone that the city of Melbourne is familiar with, it's the hometown heroes, King Parrot. Child Bite had the chance to tour with them recently. What was it like being on the road with those guys? Oh, yeah, those guys are fucking great. We're so happy. I don't even know if uh, if they're an Australian band anymore because they tour over here more than half of the year. I feel like they're here. They're more American now than fucking Australian, um, which, I mean, kudos to those guys. They're fucking... I, of course, they've been doing shit in different projects in the past to, um, you know, to get to where they are now. But for being like a relatively new band over the past couple of years, uh, I'm I'm very inspired by how much they've accomplished and what they're what they're doing, and just the uh, you know, the the work ethic and the sacrifice that they'll make to to do what they have to do in the name of King Parrot is uh, is truly inspiring. Um, yeah, we met those guys. We got to do a cut. We're, we're basically now we're, uh, label mates with them on the, uh, house core label, which I'm sure we'll talk about more in a bit. But, uh, uh, because through that connection, we were both going down to Austin, Texas last fall to play at a festival called the house core horror film festival. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, so we both happened to be heading that way. I think they were just spent some time in Vermont writing their record and we're starting to do some shows on the way to texas we're from detroit not too far away from there and uh same general region ish and uh needed to do some shows on the way down too so we just decided to to pair up on a couple of them and uh it was it was great it was uh you know for us and, and if anybody checks us out you'll see that we're not you know we're, we're, we i <laughs> I don't, I'm trying to think how to say it. We, you know, we're always the black sheep on a bill, basically. Like, uh, so whether you know, usually bands sound a little more like a certain genre. And of course, not to say that King Parrot doesn't have like their own thing going on, but it's safe to say that they're an extreme metal, uh, grindcore kind of kind of band a lot of times. And so sometimes we're like, all right, let's see how this goes over. And uh, we clicked with those guys right away. We had a great time with them. I think the very first show with them, uh, I was standing up front during their whole set, and Matt, the singer, kind of pushed the the backup mic down towards me, and so I just grabbed it and started doing, uh, uh, what was it, shit on the liver, I think. And uh, yeah, it was. Uh, we, we had a great time. We, we did a few shows with them, then we parted ways did in, in our own shows, and then met up down in Texas and got to... Uh, play at the festival together and hang out for a few days and uh can't say enough good things about them hilarious dudes i mean if you've ever met them or seen any of their music videos you know they're fucking hilarious and they're brutal as hell so it's the the best of both worlds so uh you should be uh, happy to have them be in your uh you know be in your ambassadors absolutely they're actually good friends of mine so it's sort of why i asked it i've seen their music videos I actually got slats to do the voice in- intro for the radio show that I'm doing. Dude, that's, I mean, he, he's got a beautiful voice. I mean, I, not to take anything, anything away from his, his, uh, stunning physical looks, but his voice is top notch. We're, I want him to fucking do the intro for our album or something. I don't know. I, I want him to do my voicemail message. I want him to, to be, I want to have his voice. I want to be him. So you also mentioned that King Parrot and Child Bite are label mates on House Call Records, which is ran by Phil Anselmo. How did you get to meet Phil? Uh, I, you know what? It's uh, it's just uh, who you know, you know, and I, I happen to be good friends with his fiance, Kate Richardson. We actually met when we were, oh, I was maybe, I was probably... 15 or 16 years old and she was maybe I think two years younger than me and uh, I, I was probably a terrible influence on her and but we hung out all throughout high school and then everybody you know goes their own ways I didn't know where she went but I, I went to college moved away for a while started doing some different band shit art shit whatever and just lost touch with her and then through the the magic of Facebook 
we ran back into each other and she was seeing like I was doing uh, I do all these like posters for I do them for all sorts of bands like smaller bands like my own band or or bigger national type bands and I'll do these posters and so I would I would throw up some images online to show people and she's like oh shit Sean I didn't know you're doing this stuff now we should get you to do some stuff for my fiance's band uh, oh you might know him Phil Anselmo I was like oh yeah I, I would do that and so started doing some art for those guys and uh, really how we got to know him is we I might be jumping ahead of subject or two but you know try and keep up we uh in my band we were at one point a couple of years ago joking around about doing some anal cunt covers I don't know I'm assuming this is an internet radio station and I can say those words uh, regardless they're uh, they're body parts you know it's it's all natural we, we, we thought it'd be funny to do some anal cunt songs. At first it was just like, oh, I could make the CB look like the AC and maybe we'll make a sticker or something. Ha ha, that's a stupid idea that we should do it. And then we're like, oh, let's take the stupid idea even further. We kept going with it and we're like, oh, maybe we should do some covers of those songs. And I was the only one in the band that even really knew that stuff and because I'm the one with more of the extreme metal background. Uh, and uh, I was, you know, yeah, I think that'd be fun to do some of that shit. I used to play in bands like that and whatever. It'd be different for us and and might just add some uh, interesting flavor to our our musical stew for, for future original music. And uh, so we started doing that and talking about doing these songs and we were like, well, you know, I'm not really like a grindy kind of death metal voice. Maybe we would uh, get a guest vocalist and we were talking about different local guys from from metal bands that might fit the bill and then that just got my brain going like well i know back in uh i think 1996 you know there's me at the time talking to the bandmates that just from being a you know a nerdy metalhead kid and reading the liner notes of every cd i buy or cassette or whatever it's like i know in 1996 on pantera's uh Shit, which record was that? Great Southern Trend Kill. The Great Southern Trend Kill, yes. Uh, on that record, they had Seth Putnam doing a bunch of backing vocals. And I think that same year, I'm pretty sure the Anal Cunt record that came out was called 40 More Reasons to Hate Us, something like that. And I remember that one had a bunch of Phil Anselmo backing vocal credits. I was like, those guys must be buddies or must have been buddies because – uh, I think Seth had died then, or maybe he hadn't even died when we had the, the idea. I don't remember. But uh, so I was like, you know, and my friend is, you know, with him. And, and Kate also, she's not just a, uh, she's not just arm candy. She also uh, happens to run the Housecore record label. She tour manages for Down. So she's heavily involved with all of his music stuff. And I was like, you know. He, I, I give it a very low percentage. This is like, you know, like lot of winning the lotto kind of percentage. But I was like, it might be worth running to buyer and just, just on the off chance, maybe he's like feeling particularly vulnerable or down on himself and wants to slum it with some random dudes from Detroit. But uh, you know, I was like, I'll, I'll run it by him. But I wanted to record it first because I was like, I, you know, I'm sure he has a million people getting a hold of him all the time hey, you should do this with my shitty band or you should put our shit out or you should join my band or just it's do, whatever. I'm sure he's inundated with that shit every fucking day of the week. So I was like, let's record this stuff, make it badass, and then present it to him, you know, so it's, you know, presentable. And then he'll get a better idea and be like, oh, okay, I can tell if it sucks or not. So we sent that over to him, uh, to Kate to show to him and, uh, and, and they they set it up so that when Down came through, this had been, uh, fuck, I think 2012, when Down came through Detroit, or Pontiac, Michigan, to be uh, exact, they had Child Bite open. So we're like, great, there's a chance he can check us out, blah, blah, blah. So we played, and, uh, and they, yeah, that same night, he was like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah I heard those anal cut songs, and uh, sounds good, I'll do it. So we're like, well, fuck. All right, it's happening. And uh, about uh, about a year la- after that, he ended up finding the time to track the vocals. And about a year after that, we had the records in our hands. So from concept to completion, it was it was maybe a two and a half year project 
which is a little ridiculous for a record that's only five minutes long. But but uh, I'm, I'm glad we held out for it. Do you plan on uh, recording any more music with Phil soon, like with him on vocals as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, taking a sip of the. Of the it's all right. Um, yes, we have. We already have actually. There's. Uh, we did a. Uh, we were asked to contribute to a Celtic Frost tribute record uh, a little while ago. That's going to be coming out sometime this spring. I know they want to have it in time for the Maryland Death Festival uh, that happens in Mar- Baltimore, Maryland, uh, or in May. So I know that record's going to be out then. Uh, and we're one of the bands on it. Yeah, so that's that's the next installment of uh, Phil slumming it with Child Bite. We did a, a song called The Usurper uh, off the Two Megatherian record. And uh, we actually did a little bit of the intro, Innocence and Wrath. We did that intro going into Usurper. But then we also asked Phil, you know, because we live so far away from him, we're like a maybe 18 or 20 hour drive from New Orleans. So it's it just makes more sense for us to throw shit down here through the magic of the internet, send it over to him, and then he can take care of it at his leisure. Uh, but we So we had him do the vocals for the Usurper, but we did say, hey, what if you did uh, there's another uh, usur- or another uh, Celtic Frost intro track called Human that's off the record before that that um, off Morbid Tales that uh, is just a layered vocals going rrr, rrr, whatever a whole layer of them blur. So we just said, dude, you should do that. So we have an intro going into an intro going into a song. And that's how we uh, tricked the people doing the comp to to make our song be the first one on it. That's a great idea. You know, you got to be tricky to stand out nowadays. There's there's a million bands. There are there's a plethora of crabs in these buckets, and uh, you got to do something to to climb climb to the rim. And that's that's our that's what we came up with. I think people have managed to succeed in doing that with music videos nowadays. Yeah, I agree. Because on one hand, the thought is like, well, music video, that's, you know, it's not going to help your band. Uh, not that everything's about money, but it's not going to help you financially, on, you know, for sure. It's, uh, it's just like, on one hand, you look at it as being like, oh, it's just like a cool thing we can do, some kind of fun thing. But as far as promotion, uh that's really what you have to do to stand out. You have to make something and you know, your buddies King parrot or masters of it that they you come up with. We got to come up with something that, you know, is, is really going to grab people's attention and is worth them sharing with their friends. You know, something, if you put something together that makes, you know, if, if we put something together that makes me feel like I have to show this to somebody, or if I see, you know, like the King parrot guys, if I see one of the videos, and I'm like, fuck! I gotta share this with people on Facebook or send it or email to my buddies or whatever. Then you you really hit something, and like you like you're just getting to. You, you kind of have to do shit like that to stand out from. Uh, it's basically who's willing to work the hardest, you know? Who's willing to put it? I mean, not a, you got to be a good band, and you have to have good ideas. You can't just be putting out a work hard at putting out a a, a shit ton of you know crap. Cause that's or a crap ton of shit. Cause that's not going to entertain anybody. You're just going to annoy everybody. I mean, I guess that you know maybe going back to anal cunt, maybe that does work on one hand. But um, yeah, I think uh, coming up with some good ideas and and working really hard, getting uh, working with people like like for video stuff. You know, having either having people in your band or having friends that can put together something that looks awesome, that's professional. Uh, and is really entertaining is is definitely key in this weird era that we're tr- everybody's still trying to figure out how to function in. So Child Bite have released four EPs over the past three years. One of those being the Anal Cunt Tribute EP. From what I'm aware, yeah. you're finally working on a new full length album at the moment. How is it coming along? Oh, good, good. It it feels good. It's uh. The EP thing has been mainly just, I guess, a little bit of history, which will make sense for why our records have come out the way they have, is that it started out with different guys, as many bands have, uh, and 
put out a record. Oh, put out an EP. And then like, oh, we have a new band member join. Okay, well, let's work on another record. Okay, and then another EP. Sure. And then we're, everything's moving along smoothly. And then when you, when you're adding members, that's not such a problem. When you're losing members, it kind of, depending on what instrument they play, it can really kind of throw a wrench in the works. And uh, it was around, I don't know, like 2009 or 10, where we had a couple members gone, and it was our band was kind of limping along with mostly just myself and the other Sean in the band, uh, which is Sean Clancy, the bass player. And it was it was pretty much we were just determined to keep this thing going, and we would. But we also didn't want to just get anybody in the band. We had a high a high bar, high standard for uh, ability and personality and availability because we were a touring band and uh, we don't we can't just get somebody in that's going to be like, oh well, I've got three kids and sixty hours of work a week, so I can't go on tour. And then we're like, well, fuck, now we're that's just as big of a problem as if we didn't have anybody. So there was a while there that we. We're getting fill-in guys and just touring. Uh, and then the first of those four EPs that you just brought up was at a point where we, even though we didn't even have a drummer at the time, we just were getting very impatient. And we we're like, we got to, let's, we need to, we've been playing the same shit for a year and a half, two years now. Like we need to make this happen. So we got a buddy of ours, uh, Canadian guy from Toronto named Moshe Rosenberg. Uh, we got him to come in. He's an insane drummer. Like, it is a very strange a very strange drummer that comes up with the types of shit that most drummers would never think of. And he's super fast, too. And it's it was really weird. And anyway, so we, like, we decided, let, dude, let's get this guy to come in. We'll write a record with him. He'll be like the guest drummer or whatever. So that was the uh, Monomania record. And we did that. And... So and we were like, well, we'll just do an EP with him, you know, because it's like kind of a weird thing having a not a non full time guy. Uh, so we'll just make it an EP. It's its own little statement or whatever. Um, and then after that, we got a full time guy, and we were like, we start working on another record. And we were like, well, it's he seems a little on the fence. We're not sure how long he's gonna last. So let's just uh, let's just do another EP. And and that turned out in a way to, to to make sense. He lasted longer than we thought, but we uh, but basically we were like, if somebody's not going to full time be in the band, let's just make like a short statement with them, a short EP. So when we do find Mister Wright, we can like really get into full length territory with him, and he can feel like a uh, ownership over it, as opposed to like he's coming in like playing a bunch of covers, you know, for forever. Which I think it can be like if you're in a band for you know, the first, the first year or so that you join a, a, uh, existing band or whatever, a band that's already been going for a while. So with that guy, we did the vision crimes EP and a little, we did some touring for that and a little while later he was done. And, but he is also the same guy. This guy's Ben. He doesn't need to be nameless Ben Moore. And, uh, he did the vision crimes and then he was also did the morbid hits record uh the five inch with phil but as i said earlier we that record took almost two and a half years to come out from when we were talking about it so it, he was already out of the band by that by the time that record came out um but we have we have found mr wright his name is jeff kraus uh and he's a he's a grand rapids michigan guy which is the other side of the state but uh it's only it's only a couple hours away so we decided we can we can he was he was so perfect. It was worth making the long term or the long distance relationship work. So that brings us to uh, the fourth EP, which is uh, Vision Crimes, the one that just came out. Which I'm embarrassed. I was having trouble remembering too many beers. But uh, yeah, so he's the one that's on Vision Crimes, and uh, that one came out on Housecore this past fall, and. Uh, you mean strange waste, right? Oh yeah, dude. So many fucking beers. So many. I mean, you can probably relate. You have beer there, right? Strange waste is the record that came out. You can edit this all out, even though I know you won't. Uh, on Housecore, uh, as a CD and a double seven inch, which was us just being the fucking weirdos that we are, and uh, 
Yeah, that's that's the latest. But now we can finally work on a full length. Now we have a guy that we know is going to stick around for the long haul because he has nothing better to do, just like the rest of us don't. And uh, it feels good. We're we've uh, fuck. We're we we do writing in phases, and we uh, so we'll get together several times just working out a couple riffs that might be part of the same song. And we'll be like, all right, spend like an hour or so on that. We're like, all right, that's fine. Let's record it like uh, on my phone with a little mic and just have a quick demo of just those couple of parts. Move on to the next. And we just try and keep moving. We're not a band that'll get together and like in one on one Friday night, we wrote the whole song from start to finish. We don't ever do that. We just we get together and we'll cr- on one Friday night crank out like five different like potential songs like two three four five little riffs or parts that could be a song and we record them all because we know we'd forget that shit and then after we've done a shit ton of those or a crap ton like i was saying earlier maybe uh maybe around i think this time we had like 18 of those that we that we were happy with now we're going back through and we're doing like a round two and we're picking our favorites and you know we'll kind of vote on them everybody sends me an email here are my top five of those here's my top five and i'll it's very scientific you know i I can't get into all the details but we'll be like all right three of us picked demo number eight so that one is a keeper so then the next time we get together let's work on demo number eight and we'll like add parts start structuring it and we'll get it someplace where it's like a pretty well together it's got an intro and outro the verse chorus bridge all that um starting to figure out some vocal ideas but obviously you gotta you know take some time with writing lyrics and, and sitting with the music a little bit to to finalize that shit but um but uh yeah that's where we're at now and so we've got we've got like you know three or so of those like these songs that are like starting to take shape and and uh, we're not gonna be recording that record until end of april so we've got whatever three months three solid months to to get our shit in gear for me to write a whole bunch of lyrics for us to organize a whole bunch of riffs and and make a record that's worth presenting mr anselmo and and uh having him help us um you know put the whole thing together yeah because you're also recording that in an anselmo studio yeah 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 like you like we talked about earlier the um the other songs we've done with him the the uh, anal cunt songs and the um celtic frost music was all done remotely where we would record the shit at a local studio in detroit and then he would record his vocals down there but yeah this will be our first time going down there spending some time on an album and uh and yeah and doing it like there with him you know he's got his studios on his property uh basically in his backyard so it'll be, it'll be nice we'll be able to you know just sleep in a little bit everybody starts to wake up we'll figure out what are we going to work on today and we'll go in there and uh and uh, and take our time we're gonna be there for fuck two weeks which we've never done anything like that we've uh like strange waste for instance was recorded in a it's a it's a shorter record it's it's an ep it's like 18 minutes long but it was recorded in two days so you know by that math we should do a full length in four days but instead we're going to spend 14 so that's we're really looking forward to that it's just this this is on his dime it's it's him taking his time with his engineer on us and and to feel comfortable that we've taken the right amount of time he wants to spend you know a couple weeks on it which we're thrilled about because usually we're, uh, you know, it's coming out of our pockets and we, we go to nice studios. So, you know, we're never, we're never, you know, doing anything too cheap, but, uh, so we just have to save, usually have to save up for a while and then just to be able to be someplace for like three or four days. So recently you stepped down from guitar duties and child bite and decided to only do vocals and, you only have one guitarist for a band like child bite who has lots of different weird guitar parts rather than just two guitarists playing the same riffs over and over what made you make this decision you know it, it was kind of a it was a it was a tricky decision you know we've been doing this band i mean i started it and i was playing guitar in it since the beginning 
that was about nine, a little over nine years ago. So it's a, it's a little strange for somebody like nine years into their band to be like, hey, I'm not going to play guitar anymore. But um, it was it really came down that to that the music that we've been working on the way the and the music has been changing quite a bit. Like our early records were very different. It was more. It was still some like noise rock kind of stuff and a little bit of a punk kind of thing, but some of it was a little it had a little more like indie rock type of parts and was more like uh, even no wave stuff or uh, it, you know it was, it was almost more like like you know Devo or, or certain liars songs and and that kind of thing. It wasn't as heavy um, and it wasn't as complicated. Uh, so as as the music has been progressing and developing we've been getting we keep pushing ourselves you know and it's uh, it's been getting heavier and it's also been getting more technical and even though i help write a lot of the music i was i was finding that i'm i was pushing myself beyond my abilities and it was more so like and i can, and i could do it in the in the studio like i if i'm just focusing on one thing but mainly i'm talking about guitar and vocals and I was like it was I was what I was hearing and what I wanted to happen was just literally beyond what I could do and it was it was I had to take a cold hard look at myself and be like you know I, I think I just want I want to kill it I want whatever I'm doing I want to do it to the best of my ability and I want to do what is um what what my abilities lend themselves to whatever whatever it is I'm best at I should just focus on doing that uh, as opposed to you know I don't want to be the the weakest link or anything like that so I, I brought it up to the guys and I was I was like I think it's for the best and it'll it'll be a change obviously going from one guitar or two guitars down to one but but on this last tour we had a fill in guy just so we didn't cha have to change the music too much. We'd still have the two guitars and I could try out doing the, the vocals only thing. And it just felt right. It felt like, yes, this is how I'm supposed to do it. I can really push myself and, uh, you know, and, and really sell it and, and do what I perform the way that I want to perform as opposed to, uh, being tethered to the mic stand and looking down at my hands and, be like, oh shit, oh shit, I'm barely holding on, I'm barely pulling it off, and sometimes not, you know, sometimes falling a little off the, the tight rope and having to pull myself back up. So, um, it was it was a hard choice, but I, I I think it was the right one. And for what it's worth, um, I could I think our music in in one hand, and some of it we've been going this way a little bit by having certain parts, uh. Um, mimic each other or like or having like the bass and the guitar or the two guitars matching up a bit i think to an extent it's not a bad thing to take our crazy music and simplify it ever so slightly so that it's still crazy but you can tell what's going on as opposed to some stuff we've done in the past where it's just full on insanity and which is cool on one hand, almost like a lightning bolt kind of thing or something. But on another hand, it's kind of like, like it's just not what I wanted to do anymore. I was like, I want to have a strong statement, you know, and then, and we're starting to really focus more on like a punk slash metal thing uh, with a little bit of our own weirdness, you know, blended in there as well. But, it was, it was, so yeah, like I said, in wrapping that up, it was it was a hard decision, but I think it's gonna be for the best, and I'm, we're we're all really excited about this like leaner, meaner version of the band. So, what are the chances of Childbite getting to over to Australia in the future? Talk to Matt Young. <laughs> he's the one that's supposed to bring us over. No, that's a lot of pressure to put on somebody. And he's, he doesn't have any money either. But um, uh, no, we're, we're, we've been talking with those guys, really. They're, they're our main contact over there. And um, and we're really hoping to ha make it happen. Right now, it's just a matter of making it make sense. Um, you know, it's it, 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 with all the costs involved, not only just like the flights, but then like the, you know, with you know, promoters having to take a chance on it and, and all the shows involved and the, the gear and the, the, the van rental and and fuel everything involved you know obviously all your cities are really spread apart and whatnot um 
it's there's a lot of money in uh, at stake in something like that. So we're, we're right now we're trying to do the uh, work smarter versus harder thing and make it so that it makes sense when we get over there. We're working on getting a house core uh, some distribution, uh, proper distribution over there so that our records are readily available. I'm also doing things such as talking to yourself uh, and trying to get the word out a little bit. Um, I just did an interview with Heavy Magazine, which is over there. I don't remember what city they're based out of, but somebody somewhere over there, and uh, they seem pretty legit. And they're uh, so that'll be coming out at some point in the next couple of months, I'm sure. And uh, you know, just all that stuff, just trying to get the word out as much as possible and get our records over there. I know. Um, I know Matt helped out a lot, and he got us played on some other radio stations over there already over the past couple of months. So we're just pushing that kind of stuff. And as soon as it's uh, as soon as we have enough going on over there that we can can you know convince somebody, trick somebody into uh, taking a chance on us, we're on a fucking flight, man. We're we're ready. We're already saving our nickels and dimes. We're we're ready to come over. Make it happen, man. We and it seems like more and more bands are going over there. More and more people that we know are uh, have been announcing, like, "Hey, we're going over there." So, it's. It, I mean, it seems totally doable. And having those buddies in King Parrot is a, uh, you know, definitely can't hurt. So, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful that by the end of the year we can make something happen. And if not, I'm even more confident that next year we we'd be there. So I would say for sure in the next 12 to 16 months. So last question yeah. you, you mentioned before that you're an artist, you do illustrations they're on your website. Tell me about some of this art. What is it mainly just logos or tour posters? And do you have any commission work available? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've been doing really, I've been doing the art shit and the, and the band shit pretty much the same length of time i don't know how old i was maybe 13 or something years old uh, from my very first band in high school or like beginning of high school or end of junior high it was like uh well we need a cover for our tape or you know our cassette that we're putting out and we need a flyer for our concert and so i was always the one to do it and it's so it's a the music and art thing has always gone hand in hand uh for me and here i am whatever 25 years later or something just it's still the same thing but but on a, a different scale for sure uh over the past few years i've been doing uh a lot of screen printed posters which i don't know if that's too much of a thing over there there's one australian artist who's kind of a king of this shit that you should look up if you're not familiar with him named ken taylor and he's an amazing artist and he does a lot of screen printed posters for bands and and whatnot. Um, he's definitely an inspirational dude worth worth checking out. But um, yeah, it's something. It's it's a pretty big deal over here doing these screen printed posters where they're it's it's just more than just making a flyer for the show. They're the printing process is much more elaborate. They're handmade. There it'll be a limited edition type of thing where they're numbered and signed by the artist and um. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And I've been doing that for all sorts of bands, obviously started out just doing it like for my own band or friends bands, uh, here and there and, uh, quickly moved forward again, like the music and art stuff kind of like goes hand in hand where, uh, I would know a promoter from a venue through my band and he's like, Oh, you're doing those posters now. Let's, let's do that for when, you know, Danzig comes and plays or, when neurosis comes in plays and shit like that. So it's been uh, growing and I've been doing posters for shows all over the U S some, sometimes I'll even do some for, for Europe shows um, or Canadian shows or whatnot. And uh, it's uh, it's, it's been going good, but it, most of it's uh, illustration. My early stuff was more collage based, um, which I like that stuff, but I was never as happy with how the printing would turn out on those types and I found that when I was doing illustration stuff, which I really just use like Sharpies, like I'll have a thin one and a thick one for the outlines. And it's pretty uh, primitive, but uh, but it's also kind of cool. It feels like I'm going back to my roots, you know, being like a high school kid with my Sharpie trying to draw some gnarly skull to look like that, uh, you know, some pus head drawing that Metallica used or whatever. Um, 
But so it's a lot of my stuff nowadays is these crazy drawings with Sharpies and, and then, you know, and doing custom type for the bands. I try and I don't really like to use their logo. I mean, I will if I have to, but sometimes it's nice to treat this thing as its own piece that I created every single element. So it's a chance to like take some band's name and draw it out in some wild way that has never been done before. Um, and it, it, ends up, uh, you know, working out well. I mean, it was even, a, for instance, I did a poster for Napalm Death a couple of years ago, and they dug it so much, I got a call from their tour manager the next day that they wanted it for, uh, for a T-shirt and a hoodie. So, you know, within a couple of days, they were, you know, they were still on the road, and they were selling hoodies and T-shirts that had my artwork on it. And uh, So it's, uh, it, it's, it's been really cool. I get to work with a lot of bigger bands, because I think for a, for a gig poster, they're they're pretty open to somebody taking taking uh, liberties and just kind of like doing their thing with it. Whereas like if it's gonna be album art for a band, which I do that too sometimes, but there's a lot more pressure on that kind of thing because uh, it's you know it's this band's baby. This is the 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 visual representation of their record that they've been spending however many months or years writing and recording, and it's uh, there's also a uh, judge a book by a cover situation where you know this band you know my cover art might make or break this band's record as far as on one hand not make or break it but like as far as like if somebody's picking it up in a record store like and considering it they might be like eh, it looks shitty like so there's a lot more pressure on that kind of thing whereas the doing a poster for a band it's like it's one show or maybe it's one tour and yeah just do your thing i've seen the other stuff you do yeah you know have fun with it and so so I've been having, I have been having a lot of fun with it because I can do whatever the fuck I want, and uh, and people have been seeming to react positively to that. So if anyone was listening to this interview when I broadcast it and they wanted some art from you, how much would you charge for certain pieces? Oh, you know, like five bucks ish. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that translates into in uh, Australian rupees, but about eight bucks. No, um, <laughs> my wife is in the background laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, it's it's it's. Uh, I've to be honest, I've never been able to figure out a good way to do it. I'm always usually kind of undercutting myself because I'm like, oh, I don't know, you know. And I know, and that's the other thing too is like, I know bands they don't have fucking money, you know. I I'm in one. I know that. So I always there's a uh, there's a kinship there. There's a, uh, uh, a sympathy there, you know, because I am one of them. And the reason I'm able to spend, like, for instance, I think on the strange waste record, I probably spent, I don't know, at least 40, 40 to 50 hours on that album art. Like, it was, you know, maybe 35 or 40 drawing that whole thing and coloring it all in and doing all that stuff. And then like some more time, like laying it out and doing the type and, and everything else. And, and then getting it prepared to be printed and changing it for the, you know, adjusting it for the CD version. And it's, uh, it's that, I mean, that's, you know, I don't know how would I charge that to like, like another smaller band. You know, like it's, that's, you know, if I was, it really would be like five bucks an hour, you know, to like make it affordable. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tough thing, but I, I but I, I still want to do stuff for people. So we, we'll figure it out. I would say, have them get a hold of me. We'll figure it out. Awesome. Pleasure. To work within your budget. Awesome. Pleasure to interview you, Sean. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap this up? No, man. I think you, you were on top of it. You knew everything that was coming up with us and, and what we've been doing. So uh, I think we covered it all, man. We're, we're, uh, we're good. <laughs>